Welcome to Monday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. I am John Schmelk, joined by Matthew Sytak, and we'll happily take your calls as we react to Giants preseason game number two, a 28 to 10 loss to the Houston Texans down in Houston. The phone number is 201-939-4513, 201-939-4513. Tune in, give us a call. We'll talk about everything that we saw. Mr. Sytak, how was your weekend, sir? Uh, it was good. It's good. Good to be back in the building. Yeah, good to be back in the building. Um, one more preseason game to go into the regular season to see. I'm officially out of preseason mode. I just oh. have to, I, re- I, re- I rewatched that game this morning and that second half. Whoo, boy, that was tough to get through. I but, was out of preseason slash training camp mode like at least a week ago. <laughs> I'm ready for the regular. I season. knew the starters were going in this game for a half, so I was True. excited about that to see him for the first time. But at this point, I am not. Checked out's the wrong word because we gotta, you know, we'll do our 53 man roster predictions are over under is all that fun stuff that we'll do leading up to the season. Well, fun with that, but in terms of watching, I'm ready to see these guys go in a real game now. Yeah, let's finish the summer out strong, get to and healthy, the, you know, healthy, get to the 53 man roster. And then just start getting ready for the Vikings. All right, so let's not bury the lead here, Cytac. Uh, obviously, coming out of the game, all the talk about the quarterback position with the New York football giants. Daniel Jones, this is how I'll start it because I think it's a fair criticism. You cannot have a game where you turn the ball over twice early in the game, and frankly, it could have been three with the first pass of the game that hit off Derek Stingley's chest. Those And Brian Dable talked about this in his conference call yesterday in his post-game press conference. The throw to Theo Johnson, where I thought Johnson maybe could have played through the end of that play a little bit better to prevent the pick. He didn't. Really bad decision. And I know it stinks Cytac to try to eat a safety there, but I think you have to eat a safety there. You look at at the All-22, I know somebody tweeted out there was a chance to get the ball to neighbors in the middle of the field. There was no chance to get the ball to Malik neighbors in the middle of the field when you look at the All-22 there. No chance. No one's open. He either has to recognize that earlier and try to run or just take the safety because there was just nothing there and he made a poor decision to try to prevent the safety and instead of giving up two points they gave up six yeah look no one's gonna try to defend that play Daniel has said that he wanted that one back obviously coach Dable said the same thing you know there's no denying it was a bad decision however this and I (laughs) this was Daniel Jones first game back in nine over nine months since tearing his ACL and people want to you know kind of scoff at this and wave it off just because Daniel has been healthy for the last month and you know he hasn't really looked like he's been hindered by that knee injury which that's obviously a very good thing but at the end of the day this was his first time in an actual game you know having defenders coming at him with the intention of actually hitting him the first time since he tore his ACL and that was literally the first play that he saw pressure on in the game yeah. Mm-hmm. So while I will be the first to say, like, that was obviously a bad decision by Daniel, a part of me does believe that once he gets a little more comfortable being, you know, surrounded by actual pass rushers coming to tackle him, you know, having pocket, I mean, the pocket didn't really collapse on him. There was good protection. He just kind of drifted out of the pocket. And I think it was one of the tight ends. It was Manhurst. Yep. Manhurst, mm-hmm. you know, let go of his guy. Yeah, it wasn't even bad protection. It, it wasn't bad protection co- at all. That, that, I would qualify that as a coverage sack, to be totally honest with 100%. you. 100%. But my point being with all this is saying that I think when Daniel gets his footing underneath him a little bit more, when he first sees that guy coming at him, He's gonna he, will, run. Yeah. he will either run or throw that ball away immediately. I'm with you. I mean, you look at the replay. He hesitated. He like was going to throw it to Theo, held it down, was going to take the sack, realized it was going to be a safety, and then kind of just chucked it. And I, I feel like once he gets his footing underneath him again, he's going to make a smarter decision than that and just get rid of the, throw the ball out of bounds. Yeah, just throw it over Theo's head. Yeah. Into the sideline. That's all you need 100%. to do. I'm with you on that. On right. the second interception, I don't have as much, obviously, as much of a problem with. Sidetuck, I don't have a beef at all with the second interception. No, Brian Dable said that, the first of all, preseason games are not regular season games. The point of preseason games in some situations is to try things out. Clearly... It was an emphasis to push the ball downfield against the Texans on Saturday. Brian Dable wanted to see Daniel 
throw it and throw it downfield. And he did. I mean, you mentioned, you wrote about this in, in our cover three on Giants.com. Eventually. <laughs> they, they wanted to push the ball downfield. So, you know, yeah, he, he underthrew Jalen Hyde a little bit on that throw. But that one I have no issue with. I want to see them taking shots. And I think, I don't know, I either said this to, to Detino on the show in the spring or you. And I said this on the show, folks. This is not me, you know, trying to retconning my opinion on a play here. Did I not say earlier in the spring that I will deal with one or two extra interceptions if it means more big shots down the field. Yeah. I've said that multiple times. That's exactly the type of play I'm talking about. You have one-on-one coverage outside uh, with Jalen Hyatt, a guy that can run past most anyone in the league, throw it up, let him make a play. Only two issues with the play. The obvious one, a little too far inside, maybe not quite enough air under it, a little underthrown, but it's not even a terribly underthrown ball. It's like a yard and a half. He puts that a yard and a half more towards the sign over the shoulder. I might make the play. Yeah. My second problem is that, and again, I think this comes to your point, where this is preseason, not regular season. You're not scouting the defense. Might not want to throw that against Derek Stingley. <laughs> the different quarter over there, you feel a little bit better about it. But again, this is the preseason. You know, Daniel Jones isn't looking, all right, well, Derek Stingley's usually lined up on the left side of the defensive formation. I'm going to stay away from that. They don't care about that in a preseason game. So that's my issues with that play. Maybe the play that I disliked the most was the first pass of the game. <laughs> that, yeah. you know, if, if you rewatch the All-22, Stingley is literally in like a crouch staring at Daniel as he's dropping back the throw. Not even looking at Malik Neighbors. Not even looking at him. He's sitting on a play just like that. And I think, again, the first play that he's in a game since the ACL. They draw it up. You want to get neighbors involved early after he didn't have a catch in the first preseason game, right? All right, he's like, he's figuring, all right, it's the first play of the preseason. Stingley didn't play last week. He's going to play soft cover. He doesn't want to get run by in the first play. Let's do a little stop route here. I'll tell you what, Stingley was, did not have that mentality. He's like, no, first play, I'm going to go make a play. And he breaks up. And it's not like Daniel threw it late. He throws the ball way before neighbors even breaks down to get into his route. He throws it early. Neighbors doesn't get out of his route as quick as Daniel, I think, thought he would, and then Stingley just is all over it. So that play in the Theo pick with the two throws I had a problem with, um, and I would understand why the coaches and players would want those back, did not have a huge problem with the higher pick. Guys, my big takeaway, to be honest with you, and this is something you mentioned. Guys, we talked about it heading into this year. If this offense was going to get better, you have to make explosive plays down the field. They were chucking the ball down the field the whole first half. They had as many 20-plus yard attempt completions downfield in this game than they had all of last regular season with Daniel Jones. He had two last year in the regular season, two in this game. I think he had 12 in his six starts last year, pass attempts of 20 more yards. He had four in one half of football. That's a good thing. The play to Neighbors in that first drive should have been a catch if Stingley doesn't pull Neighbors' arm down so he can only get one hand up to make the play. Darius Slayton drops a beautiful back shoulder throw to the left side. Hyatt is a, what, half an inch toe out of bounds from catching a beautiful back shoulder throw to that side. Neighbors has the big catch downfield on the kind of back shouldery, jumping, twirling catch. And then the, the absolute dime to Slayton down the left sideline for 44 yards and almost went for a touchdown. Daniel settled down after those early bad plays. And I kind of talked all offseason about what I think this offense is going to look like. They're going to hand the ball to Daniel and say, yo, we're going to try to make some big plays. If there's a mistake, so be it. That's what we saw in this first half. And I loved what I saw. And the protection was good enough to allow them to play that way. So honestly, I was much more excited about what I saw in the passing game than I was nervous about maybe some of those early mistakes. I'm with you 100%. I mean, we saw two years ago, the 2022 season, Daniel Jones had the lowest interception percentage in the NFL. Turnovers haven't been a problem for him in like three and years. It, not only was it the lowest in the NFL, it set an all-time franchise record for the New York Giants in history. So I'm not worried at this stage about the interceptions. Like some of the decision-making, as we talked about it, especially with the Theo Johnson, the pick six, like – that wasn't great, and you want to see him improve on his decision-making on plays like that. But overall, I was encouraged by Daniel Jones' performance out there. So was I. Call me crazy, so was I. Honestly, I mean, and part of it, 
which is what I wrote about in our cover three article and you just briefly mentioned, was the pass protection gave him time to push the ball downfield. I mean, John Runyon didn't start. He's still nursing. Was it a, I don't know, what injury is it? I'm not sure if they've ever actually said what the injury is. Whatever the injury you. is, he was sidelined. John Michael Schmitz just returned last week towards the end of the week. He only played limited snaps, so Austin Schlotman stepped in for him. And he had 15 snaps in the game, John Michael Schmitz. Yeah, and Austin Schlotman filled in with him with the rest of the starting offensive line, minus running out there. Those guys, and I'm talking about Andrew Thomas, Greg Van Roden, Jermaine Illuminor, the, com- the combo of Schmitz and Schlotman, and then Aaron Stinney. According to Pro Football Focus, none of them gave up a single pressure while they were on the field. Not a single pressure. And look, zero. We, and we know this is against the non starters on the of course. Houston defensive front. Have you watched the Giants offensive line the last three years? It hasn't really mattered who they're playing against, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. And like we saw little bits of this during the joint practices with the Lions when going up against, you know, Aiden Hutchinson uh, on the inside, uh, Aleem, Aleem McNeil. Is that how you pronounce it? Yep. Mm-hmm. They were. Ha- protecting i mean there was no this was like individual drills but they were having good protection even in those drills in the joint practices and you know it was we saw it a little bit against the lions in the preseason game last week but especially against the texans on saturday the protection held up so well like it actually gave daniel so much time to wait for plays to develop and then take those shots down the field that's something that we did not see at all last year even the deep shots that was you know tyrod taylor calling hike and within two seconds just lofting the ball downfield to slayton or hyatt or whoever now the offensive line at least against the texans actually gave daniel time to go through his reads yeah, even, and to make plays. Sorry for interrupting. Even on the non-deep throws, I think it was third and 11 in the second quarter, and Jones drops back the pass. And side tack, how often did we watch last year where on a third and long, you barely even had an opportunity to complete a pass down the field? It was a third and 10. This was the two-minute draw at the end of the first half. The Giants had a third and 10 on their own 40-yard line, and Daniel Jones goes back to throw. He's able to settle in a clean pocket, and Neighbors runs this little, uh, it's almost like a little bit of a, of a hitch route to the left inside. He catches it for a 15-yard gain. He was actually able to drop in the pocket, let the ball go, complete it in good timing, and Neighbors converts a third and long. How many third and tens did the Giants convert last year? It not feels many. like not many I can even recall. So it was just one of those types of plays where I think – The two biggest issues with the Giants' offense the last couple years, not enough explosive plays and bad protection. And those two things looked immensely better this week. Then that's my most positive takeaway from the game, which I know some people might think is crazy because everyone's worried about the turnovers. And you should be. Five turnovers is really bad. You can't win that way. I get it. But that's also a in some ways a freak thing. It's not something that I'm looking for things that we can project Matt to the regular season and an offensive approach and protection from a veteran offensive line group. That's something I feel like we can feel a little bit better about projecting than something that's a little bit more random like turnovers week to week. Definitely. And, you know, Brian Dable was calling the plays on Saturday as he has since the end of last season. We don't know for sure yet. He hasn't announced who will be started or who will be calling the plays come week one. But, I mean, it seems like we're heading in one direction. I would be very surprised if he's not calling Same. Plays. So what Saturday gave us is a sort of a glimpse of the aggressive nature that Dable clearly wants to have in his offense. And I think that is a great thing. And you can't have that aggressive nature in your offense play calling without the protection and not only like did the offensive line not give up pressures at least according to pro football focus but if you watch the all 22 i'm sure you have there are plays where you know the texans pass us are doing like stunts with guys crossing and last year plays like that 
gave the Giants offensive line so much trouble. I can't count how many times the Giants gave up sacks because the defense ran those sort of stunt moves where you have like two guys crossing and then the the offensive lineman sort of a little confused about you know where they're supposed to go, who they're supposed to pick up. Against the Texans, that was not an issue at all. The nope. offensive linemen were switching the assignments when they saw guys doing these stunts with ease. That was such a relief for me to see. Again, the interceptions, like, it's preseason. Like, I really, I, I've, I've seen the reaction on, on social media. I, which, which by the way, is it was not on. I mean, the minute that happened in the beginning of the game, I'm doing. I'm in the FAN studio with Casillas. I look at. I'm like, oh, tomorrow's gonna be rough. <laughs> that was my. That was my, I, I knew. The same I knew thing. what it was gonna be. I thought the same exact thing. All we're trying to say is, don't start ringing the alarm bells yet. Like, there's a reason why they play preseason games that don't actually matter first before you start the regular season. So Texans ran 11 stunts according to Pro Football Focus in that game yesterday. They had one pressure. One hurry. That's it. Last year, how many do you think? Oh out no, of eleven. How many oh, pressures I, do you think they would on. have had? I can, I can actually, if you give me two seconds here, I can bring up literally what the Giants' pressure rate was allowed on stunts and twits next so year. Th- last I, year. This, what I'm assuming this stat is going to just show is already, and I've been talking about Carmen Brasillo for months about how he could be the biggest addition the Giants made all off season, and that goes. With you know, considering Brian Burns and Malik Neighbors, I said I've been saying Carmen Brasillo could be the biggest addition, and I get it's only been two preseason games, but so far, it looks like that could end up being true because his fingerprints are all over this early success that we have seen from the offensive line, and it's bringing it's not just his arrival, Matt. It's bringing him in but then also bringing in players that he's familiar with that know how to run his system and that how have, to do what they need like that Illuminor have had and success Roden. with him Correct. again Illuminor and Van Roden both of them coming off their best seasons in the NFL under Carmen Brasillo last year so last year on plays with stunts and twists the Giants allowed pressure on 52% of those plays <laughs> which is the fourth worst in the league yeah only the wow the Chiefs huh the Chiefs, the Titans, and the Bears were the three teams that were worse. And the Titans had one of the worst offensive lines in the league. I can't believe the Chiefs are there. <laughs> that's surprising. But, uh, yeah, so that that that's where they were in terms of stunts. And just to give you an idea, on um, plays without a stunt or a twist, the Giants allowed a 43% pressure rate, which was second worst in the league. Oh, this is interesting. So the Chiefs, uh, this is completely off the, the, the cuff here, but the, you know what? The Chiefs' offensive line didn't play as well last year as I thought it did. They were 19th overall, but next to last in stunts and twists. Yeesh. Well, that's how you attack that line. <laughs> um, now, real quick, before we get to your calls here, we appreciate you guys holding on. What I walked out of that game concerned about, and it's something we've talked about all offseason, Matt, because of just the way they've had to allocate their resources on defense with the huge trade and signing of Brian Burns, the secondary continues to be a bit of a worry for me. And we're not going to do this today because I don't think we'll have time. we got a bunch of calls on the line. I kind of started trying to figure out what my 53 man would look like. And I had trouble getting past four corners. I got the four corners, and you can it's not hard to figure out what the, who those four corners are. Banks, Flott, Phillips, and McLeod. After that, I'm having trouble finding guys that I feel good great about, all right, you're my fifth corner on the roster this year, just in terms of coverage. There's guys with special teams abilities that I like and I think can contribute, but you know, there were a lot of open guys and CJ Strauss, one drive right down the field, touchdown. Uh, Boyle had a drive in the fourth quarter even with the backups on the field where he went right down the field for a touchdown. If I have a concern walking out of this preseason game and the one against the Lions, do you have enough coverage back there if this defensive front isn't going to be what top and they could be if they're not going to be like a top three unit in the league do you have enough guys back there that can cover yeah i mean that is a very you know i think fair assessment of the giant secondary at the moment you know i will say i think guys like trey hawkins have played you know pretty well this summer he's flashed he's mm-hmm. flashed for sure you know even someone like Alex Johnson. Is he a corner or a safety? I, th- I think he's a corner. Okay, he's been in the slot a lot, but you can put safeties in the slot too. But I thought, out of all the DBs, I thought he actually played the best in that game, to be I, honest with I you. I agree. I agree. But I do think that, and I, I've, I said this last week on the show, the Giants, due to where they finished last year in the standings, 
are number six in the waiver wire priority list. Come cut down day, they will only have to hope that five teams pass on a guy before they get an opportunity to claim a guy off of waivers. Cornerback is a position that, as of right now, I think that they would be looking towards cut down day to maybe fill out the bottom of their the depth chart at the cornerback position based on guys getting let go from other teams. I mean, let's let's keep in mind, Jason Pinnock and Nick McLeod were both picked up that way two years ago. Yeah, good point. And I think everyone's pretty happy that those two guys are on the Giants right now. So don't think just because someone got cut from another team that that automatically means, oh, like this guy stinks. He's not going to be able to help the team out. That's very much not the case. That is a way, great way to pick up some kind of underrated talent right before the start of the season. I will say easier to find safeties that way, I think, than corners. Corners is a spot that I think a lot of teams are looking for good depth at. So oftentimes you don't see corners get let go that frequently. But to your point, Nick McLeod was kind of like a hybrid player in a lot of ways. He was one of those guys. So you hope that you can find somebody if fans didn't see it. Stephon Gilmore did get signed this morning by who the Giants will be facing in week one, the Minnesota Vikings. Shocking he signed just in time to avoid the three and a half grueling training camp period that 33 year old corners don't want to <laughs> deal with shocking how that happens out there i'm i'm i'm, I'm aghast uh but th- another thing i'd be worried about matt just real quickly a lot of injuries at the linebacker position right now i was going through my linebacker list and i i kind of put in blue all the guys i'm positive are gonna be on the 53 to start the year and i got the bobby okarake and I ended up Bobby Okereke. I mean, the next guy I could have put down was Darius Musial just because he's healthy. I don't know Darian. I don't know McFadden's injury status. I don't know Ty Johnson's Deontay Johnson's injury status. I don't know Carter Coughlin's injury status. I don't know Matt Adams' injury status. Those are four guys that you expect to play a role in that linebacker core on defense and in special teams. And four of them, I don't know when they're going to be ready to play football. It's a problem. Yeah, it, it's not good. Although I do. Didn't Coach say that he expects Carter Coughlin back sometime this He said week? he's working back, so yeah. I, I think thought last week he made it sound like if he it was, might be back if it was this one, week. I think he's the guy I, I feel best about, but he's also, to me at least, more of a special teams guy than a, than a defense guy. That's true. And we haven't gotten you know the updates injury-wise from about Micah McFadden or Matthew Adams. That'll be tomorrow, probably. That'll be tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I mean, fingers crossed, hopefully they're not injured too too badly and they'll be back soon and same goes for Deontay Johnson but yeah I mean depth at linebacker right now given the injuries that is that's a fair cause of concern I mean the good thing is we're still a little under three weeks away from week one I think three weeks from yesterday is will be week one Vikings so there's still time but yeah I mean even for you know this weekend's game against the Jets I don't know because you don't want Bobby Okereke I don't know we don't know who's going to play starters wise if they're going to play at all but certainly Bobby Okereke will not be playing the entire game no. or even close to it no. so just for the fact of getting through the game the Giants are they're going to need bodies to play the linebacker position yeah you might have to have a couple of you know ads this week at linebacker. So, and Dar- Darren yep. Beavers is another guy who's going to get a lot of playing time this year. Sure. He missed a couple tackles in the second half, which you don't like to see. But those are the other two things that I took out of the game, Matt. Anything else before we get to the calls here that you want to touch on? I feel like we just, even if it's very briefly, just got to mention that Elijah Chapman hustle play. Oh, oh thank you. No, we should definitely. That we haven't was... talked about Malik Neighbors yet either, by the way. We should talk about him too. Yeah, we've been talking about him for months. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Elijah Chapman. Oh, boy. I mean, I'm sure Giants fans that were watching, you know, heard Carl Banks on the broadcast, what he was saying. I did not. What did he say? Did, did he lose he his mind? He was, yeah, you could say that. So did and O'Hara on the radio. Basically O'Hara saying. Did too. Ladies and gentlemen, like Elijah Chapman just earned his spot on the roster from that one play alone. I mean, Elijah Chapman has also been playing well all summer. It's not like that was the first time we've heard his name called. He led the Giants with five pressures against the Lions in the first preseason game and has been flashing throughout practice. So this is not, I guess, too big of a surprise, but... I was certainly surprised to see him run, was it 45 yards down the field? And, you know, it ended up not mattering because the guy, the running back, J.J. Taylor, actually stepped out of bounds right before Chapman caught up to him. But 
Chapman certainly didn't know that, nor did the running back. Both of them were running full speed, and Chapman caught up from him, caught up to the running back. At This is a six-foot, 200, I think, 78-pound defensive tackle that caught up. Patterson said he was 285 last week, even oh, more impressive. 285. Caught up to this running back, you know, full, like, DK Metcalf against the Cardinals a few years ago style. Like, that was so impressive to see, and that is the type of plays, first of all, they, first of all that you want to see any player make during the preseason, but especially an undrafted rookie who's fighting for a roster spot, that is the sort of hustle play that the coaches are going to throw up onto the big screen and like give him a standing ovation for the, that sort of hustle. And dude, the hustle part of it is great. I'm more impressed with the speed. Oh man, like we just came out of the Olympics, right? And you get to those like 800 meter, 10,000 meter races where they come around that last stretch in the straightaway, and there's always the one guy who's like in third place but he saves some back and he's got that extra juice and you see just some turning on and start passing guys, right? And he ends up usually winning or coming in second place because he gains all their ground. Elijah Chapman was gaining ground on a 200 pound running back. Legit gaining ground. It looked like that, uh, the American dude in the 800 meters where he just turns it on and he's on the inside and he just, and his ability to, to catch up to him. Yeah, uh, just very, very impressive. And that defensive tackle spot, they're trying to figure out who their guys are there, okay? They just traded Jordan Phillips. And just to give you an idea, Chapman played the fourth most snaps on defense with 36. Horn played the fifth most with 34. Davidson played the sixth most with 33. Jordan Riley played the ninth most with 29. Those are the main four guys with the trade of Jordan Phillips that are going to be competing for those defensive tackle spots behind, obviously, your big guys, Dexter Lawrence and Nacho Nunez Roches. So they're trying to figure out which one of those guys, and Ryder Anderson came out with a hamstring too. That's another thing to keep an eye on. That's a guy that was right in the mix with them too to figure out what's going to happen there. So keep an eye on that spot. Finally, Malik Neighbors is awesome. He continues to be awesome. He's been awesome in camp. He's been awesome in a game. I cannot wait to see him play in real football games, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, what we saw him do (laughs) against the Texans on Saturday is what we've been seeing him do on the practice field just about every single day since OTA started back in May. So... Yeah. Yeah, he's terrific. <laughs> I, 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 guys, I wish I could give you more than that, but, I, you know, and again, I think the confidence DJ will have throwing to him deep even when he's not covered, to your points, if you're going to throw those contested balls, throw him to neighbors, it's just really, really, really impressive. One, just one more quick thing just yeah, about, about Chapman. Yeah. I think we saw with that one run why he earned the nickname Baby Bison. Are Bison That's, fast? Uh, bison are fast when they get going. And he, they, you know, the baby part is because he's a little smaller than your stereotypical defensive tackle. But don't let that size fool you. Dom, look up Bison top speed. I don't know how <laughs> fast Bison can run. Okay? I think I actually saw one of the beat reporters tweet this yesterday that outside of, I think it was outside of Eric Gray, Elijah Chapman reached a top speed on that run faster than any other Giants running back registered at their top speed against the Texans. Do you know what the top speed was by any chance? It was 16 point, okay. I want to say 16.28, maybe, got it. something like that. All right, Dom, you got it? 35 miles per hour. Woo! Bisons can roll! Faster than most horses and three times faster than humans. There you go. Faster than most horses? Yeah. Baby, wow. Baby bison. And by the way, just for the record, if people don't know this, I'm, I'm a big zoo animal guy. Like, if, if like, <laughs> like traditionally, you talk about how, like, you know, all the American buffalo that got killed when everybody migrated west those are actually bison they're not buffalo they're actually are bison so that's a there you go bison just so people understand that <laughs> anyway 201-939-4513 big blue kickoff live is presented by cadillac official luxury vehicle of the new york football giants and i will take this time to tell you to go subscribe to the giant subtle podcast folks a lot of good stuff coming your way i don't think today's episode is up yet SciTech has that been posted yet i don't want to give the uh, uh, teaser on who it is if it's not up there yet. no I, I posted it a couple hours ago perfect Jeff Fiegels makes his triumphant return. He's on the Giant Subtle Podcast. I talked to him about a week ago. We talk about the team a little bit. We kind of just have fun. <laughs> so if you want to go check out Jeff Fiegels on the Giant Subtle Podcast, it's not like a game reaction podcast, guys. We have the rapid reaction, which is the episode before that, which is up there if you want that. So uh, if you miss Jeff Fiegels like like we did, uh, go check that out on the Giant Subtle Podcast. Giants.com slash podcast, Giants mobile app. Make sure you go check that out out. All right, 201-939-4513. Let's go to Donnie and Queens to lead us off there. Dom, Donnie, what's up? Hey, guys. How are you? Good. Um, 
I was calling about the secondary, but you, you, you kind of laid it out for me. And, and frankly, I, I have to touch on your, your, your takes here on, the, on Daniel's performance. And, you know, with, with all due respect, I, I don't know a better way to word this. It, it almost seems like you guys are speaking out, uh, out of both sides of your mouth, and, and, and I'll explain. We're supposed to watch what happened in the secondary and be worried about it. Yeah. We're supposed to be encouraged by the offensive line. But with Daniel's performance, we're basically just caveating everything where, well, you know, it was his first play back, and, you know, I'm not worried about him throwing balls downfield, and if he throws some interceptions, that's fine. And, and I almost agree with, with that, you know, the Hyatt interception. I, I can almost, you know, I can live with that because I understand the premise. Oh, Donnie, Donnie, but, I, Do, Donnie, in, in fairness, I, I, I was pretty hard on him on the throw to Theo Johnson and the, uh, and, and the first throw of the game that Stingley almost picked. I was very tough sure, on those two plays. But, you know, the overall thing was, you know, he's rusty. It was his first time seeing pressure. Like, I, I don't think Aaron Rodgers would have done that, uh, you know, who was out all of last year also. And, and, I, and, and for Giants fans here... No, Donnie, they were bad wanna, plays. They were bad plays. No one's arguing right, they weren't I, bad and, plays. And I don't want to pretend here, like, this isn't something we've seen from him in the past. And, and I'll give you an example. The first ball of the ball was his worst throw. I agree with that. I agree with that. I can almost accept that the, the, the pick six was like a brain fart play. That actually was more like an Eli play in some ways than, than maybe a Daniel play, characteristically. No, I agree with that. I think that's fair. But that first throw is exactly what, I think his name is Witherspoon, the, the corner on the Seahawks had last year. After the pick six is that we know he locks in to his first guy, and that's exactly what happened. So with Daniel, in, in a half of football, he put seven points on the board for the other team. He took most likely at least a field goal away on the Hyatt interception. And then late in the half, we didn't even get to this play yet, he misses Eric Gray in a wheel route, throws the ball, you know, low at his feet. That could have kept the drive going for, for more points. You know, Donnie, on that just, play, honestly, I watched that play on the All-22. The safety's coming down on Gray. If he leads him out in front, it might be a hospital ball, to be totally honest with you. So I'm, I'm, back I'm not, I think, and I think he was trying to throw it to him back shoulder. Right, but he, he threw it inaccurately. You know, he didn't put it in a spot where he could catch it. And I'm just saying that in a half of football, for this Giants team, this was a real game, Daniel Jones would have destroyed their chances to win the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Donnie, no argument. That is 100% correct. You know, I have no injury, argument with you. Injuries or not, this is a guy going into his sixth year. And th- th- look, I'm not the kind of fan that boos at games. I think it makes no sense. But the fan base, th- this is put up or shut up for this kid. And it was just really disappointing from a fan perspective where the first look at him with, yes, improved line play, improved wide receiver play, we still saw the same kind of crap that has held Daniel Jones back in his career. Yeah, but Donnie, in fairness, though, we also saw stuff later in the half that I've gotten nothing but complaints from fans about in the last two years calling up about his unwillingness to throw the ball down the field. That might have been the biggest complaint I've got about Daniel Jones over the last two years. And the reason I'm taking the performance as more of a positive is because I've harped on that so much where you need explosive plays. That's something that I think has held this offense back is the inability to create explosive plays down the field and this is the most I've seen a Giants team throw the ball down the field since maybe 2016 it was like yeah, it's like I'm, nine years right and I agree with that and that is something they definitely have to do because even if like like the interception with Hyatt if they, you know there's one of those a game but you get three or four big plays or a PI it'll upset itself but he can't he's not good enough to make the little mistakes throughout the course of the game that add up on him. No, that's fair. He's just fair. not good enough, good enough to overcome it. And, I, and, and well, last thing, a lot of the reasons for his low interceptions, you know, early in his career is because of things like that, where they, they've been a very conservative offense. You know, last year, I think he threw more picks in his short stint than he did all of 2022. So, look, <laughs> Daniel had an opportunity to go out there with, you know, the best situation around him. And give a, a confidence boost to the fan base, which does matter. You know, the morale of the fan base does matter in terms of affecting the team's performance and his teammates. I'm sure some of his teammates are saying, you know, what the hell? I've seen this one before. So I, I just think, you know, we got to take the kid gloves off here. Stop making excuses for this kid um, and just raise the bar. You know, if the bar is too low for him. Yeah, I just just a very very. I, I honestly, he ruined the the, the 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 game for me in many ways. So. No, Donnie, no, no, Donnie. In fairness, yeah. when I, when I opened the show, and this is Schmelk talking, I did not make any excuses for those first two bad throws. 
Okay, I, I'm going to be honest. I came in probably a minute or so into the show. Okay, I got you. I just, I just did hear like, well, it was his first time being pre- maybe Matt said it, and like, you know, it's not a personal attack. I'm just kind of venting here. You know, we all have different opinions, and you know, I don't think Daniel stinks, but I think what's kind of held him back is he just there's just too many little things that add up over the course of the game. That I mean, it's a lot of times it's not something huge, but it's like that little, you know, he could have hit this guy, but he didn't. Like. I would say the microcosm of Daniel Jones' career that Darius Slate throw in Washington, I think judges last year, like, could it have been caught? It was a little bit overthrown. And it's like those little things just add up for a player that is not good enough to overcome that kind of stuff. So just really disappointing to see him come out there and, and really crap the bed, I thought. So All right, I thanks. appreciate you giving the time to that. I'll appreciate it, Donnie. Go ahead, Matt. Do you want to reply? Yeah. I get what Donnie is, where he's coming from. I mean, I also said that some of the decisions Daniel made were poor decisions. Yep. Ones that him, Coach Dable, everyone has said that he would like to have back. All I was trying to say is that it is the preseason. Like, it's one thing if he came out and did this against the Vikings in week one. You know, through two interceptions, the offense had five turnovers, and the Giants got blown out. All I was trying to say earlier is that this was a game where Coach Dable said that they are going to try experimenting with things that they pro- that they potentially would not do in the regular season to sort of see how the whole offense performs. And I want to bring everyone back because in case people forgot to last year's preseason, the one game Daniel Jones went in against the Carolina Panthers, he, both Daniel and the offense looked amazing. Daniel was 8 for 9 for like 70 yards and a touchdown. And everyone at that time last year was saying, oh, well, it's the preseason. Like, it doesn't matter. Why do those stats count? Wait till he see- does it in the regular season. All I'm saying is to hold that same exact assessment that you had last year to him this year. Wait until this happens in the regular season, and then if he is, you know, making that same sort of poor decisions, then all the criticism is warranted. I understand it. But to do it now after one preseason game, that is the thing that just doesn't make much sense to me. No, I think that's fair. 201-939-4513. Let's go to Julian in Florida. He's up next. Hi, Julian. What's up, guys? How you doing? We're good, man. Hey, Julian been a little while since I called. Uh, Matt, never discussed with you before, but I've been a caller since 2016. Very familiar with you, John. Not sure where Lance Meadow went. I I don't know if I've missed that, but is he gone or is he just never (laughs) going? What happened there? No, no, Julian, um, we've spoken this on the show a few times. Uh, They they, they decided upstairs to try to give more people that are staff here um, just a a few more opportunities, so we've had to make some decisions. We love Lance. We hope to have him back at some point, but um, right now he will not be in the regular mix moving forward. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yep. And the only reason, why, and, and by the way, welcome, Matt. You've been great. I listen a lot. It's just I don't call in as much as I used to. Um, Thank you. Appreciate it. Would have been it. nice to hear. Lance. Lance is always the spicier one. If, if we could put it that. <laughs> Lance way. being sure. spicy. That may be the first time I've heard Lance being referred to. I've heard cranky. I've <laughs> heard grumpy. I, well, that's what I've heard I mean. spicy. Like, like that. I mean, spicy <laughs> as in cranky. Like okay, he's going to he be the cranky. one that puts a little spice in the comments. Like you'll, you'll see this. <laughs> nah, we and love you Lance. know what? By the way, I have a feeling you guys are not going to get the best calls today, so I'm going to try to keep as light and positive as possible. Um, And I think what the last caller was trying to tell you guys and what he has to, and a lot of our listeners, your listeners, have to understand is that this is your guy's job. And you're not always going to react to the games as if you were at a bar with your friends because that's probably what they want to hear. They want to hear you yell at the TV like we are. But you got like you know our, uh, the listeners have to understand Schmelk, Matt. You guys are professionals. You're gonna you're gonna lay out the bad, but you also have to lay out the good. So by all means, I think you guys are doing a great job. And Julian, by the way, just to be fair, I thought about this before we started. I started with the with the two bad plays. It was literally the first things out of my mouth yeah, when we started think, the I show. Think what they want you to say is kind of like what you said about the secondary, John. Like you said, the secondary is concerning, right? Like you were emphasizing that. I think what people want to hear is, "Oh my God, Daniel Jones freaking sucked, dude!" And I, and you're not going to do that. <laughs> well, like, Julian, why, I, I, I will why? say this, Julian. 
Yeah. In throwing interceptions and turning the ball over is extremely concerning. If you do that during the regular season, you're not going to win a lot of games. Right. If Daniel right. Jones throws three balls every game that could or will be picked off, very bad. Five turnovers. You are not very going bad. to win games. But that's one happy. Right. Bitch. There you go. Don't set it, guys. I said it. Set it. You happy? You go. All right, good. I got you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to lay down the bat. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it. I get where the guy's coming from. but you No, guys so do I. And, no, and look, by the way, nothing over with Don. He said I thought was particularly out of line. I totally get walking out of the game with that opinion too, and that's sure. fine. Yep. Yep. And we're throwing F bombs here at the house when we're watching, <laughs> and that's not what you guys are gonna do, and that's fine, and that's okay. Um I'm You should have heard side tag before the show, Julian. My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try my best not to throw any F bombs out. Yes, time. please don't do that. <laughs> right, go I'm gonna go yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm gonna go into the bad and the good and the and the truth, okay? So here's the bad, right? Uh secondary was just bad. It was just bad. Um, I'm, I'm obviously going to get into the DJ stuff, but that's the most like obvious thing that, that's facing us. But the secondary is just, <laughs> not to quote you, John, but the secondary is extremely concerning. And I just don't understand why. And it, it could be a money thing, and I don't exactly know how expensive the guy is, but we just saw Gilmore sign for, what, $8 million, $10 million for a one year. Um, but, you know, even someone like Xavier Howard, who was a top corner for the longest time. Now, granted, he fell off hard. I'm a, I live in Miami. I go to a lot of Dolphins games. I, I know Xavier Howard has fell off. He has some off the field stuff, too, Julian. A lot of off yeah, the field yeah, stuff. That's true. That's true. They, uh, I forgot to mention that. But it, without even him, any other corner out there that's a veteran presence, I believe that that's very needed when you have such a young corner room like we do and john and paulie and all you guys have said it so many times throughout these years that the hardest position to come into from college is probably corner and quarterback and some would argue that it's even corner more than the quarterback it takes years to develop i mean unless you're soft gardener and you come off out of college and you're just a rock star and banks had a good year last year did he have the best no but i do think it's important that we sign a veteran presence into this corner room and it doesn't have to be a rock star it doesn't have to be the most expensive guy but just having a veteran presence there is going to be huge for this young team um that's one now a secondary flat out now that. julian the only good news of that is that you were missing flot in this game and a lot of the issues came with the backups in so you hope with a combination of banks phillips mcleod Flot that you can figure things out, but as you well know, you know the hamstrings, calves, quads, those things happen with DBs. All it takes is one injury, correct? And, 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 yeah. and then and then you got a bigger problem. But I, I feel okay about those top four, where I th I know the level of play I'm going to get out of that group. But then when you start getting into the next group, I I, I think okay. So what's the topic two for you before we say goodbye, Julian? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll that's okay. To no, you're possible. good. So uh, DJ's decision making on year six is just that. And I can understand, listen, that game, that throw to Hyatt, I'm sorry, I'll say it out loud. I don't care if anyone disagrees with me. It was a great throw. It was right there where it needed to be. Hyatt's hands were out there. It was going to hit his hands. Should it have been a little bit more over the corner? Sure, we can, you know, we can get picky on that. Um, not, I mean, just a great word to use, picky. But um, I just think it was a great play by Stingley, honestly. That was a great defensive play. That ball, if it had been any other corner, that was going in highest hand. Um, obviously, DJ needs to know to throw it a little bit higher than that and maybe just a little bit over. But I can live with those picks. I can live with that. If yeah. I'm watching a regular season game, I'm okay with that. I agree with that. What, what I'm not okay with is the second interception and obviously the first throw of the game. Now, when you watch Caleb Williams and when you watch J.J. McCarthy and when you watch Jaden Daniels all being in their first preseason game, getting first-time preseason NFL snaps, besides the athleticism, we all understand, what is it that D.J. just looks so different from them in? It's the confidence. I mean, when you saw J.J. McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, and Caleb back there, even when the pocket is collapsing, and like I said, let's take that athleticism out of it because obviously not everyone's going to roll around like Caleb Williams. But J.J. McCarthy, out of the three of them, just looks so comfortable inside that offense, throwing those balls. I mean, like, it, it, it just the confidence was there. And it's year six, 
and I still don't see it in DJ where he is sitting. I get it. His, his O line was bad for a long time. This game, it looked pretty damn good to me. I felt like but, we saw that in the second quarter, though, Julian. Don't you think that that, that Jones looked pretty confident in that pocket, stepping into throws? I don't want to throw a screw on what you're saying, but let's let's be real. That was the second stringers. Let's be honest, okay? Well, honestly, so I, honestly, Houston didn't play many of their first stringers in the first quarter either. To be honest with you. Yeah, exactly. So you know where are we go. Like I get it. Like I, I again, we want to be we want to throw some positives out there, and that's fine. And actually, I do think DJ made a lot of good throws in the second half. He yeah, did. he did. Um, but. But let's just go with this. Do you guys know when's the last time DJ has not thrown a pick in a game where he wasn't injured? No, I do not. I have not looked at that. <laughs> it no. was the Vikings playoff game. Every game since then, he has thrown a pick. And and I and I like I said, that Hyatt one that we saw yesterday, it's okay. That's going to happen. Like you said, John. Like you guys labeled. We want to see more ball, down the ball down the field balls thrown. But when you see those kind of picks and when we're turning the ball over that much and where we're not scoring touchdowns, that's the problem. DJ's confidence is bad. He's throwing a turnover every single game except the ones he got hurt because he got out of the game early. But every game since the Vikings playoff, he's thrown picks. And let's not even talk about that Seahawks one last year because that, that Seahawks pick in the end zone, that's when I was – you want to talk about cursing out of throwing things at the TV. That, that was it for me. That was a bad pick. And it was a bad pick. It was a bad pick. And it's been six years. Nine months, we get it. He's been injured. He get back. He just got back. He's throwing around, but it's just that confidence. Why do we see that in JJ McCarthy? Why do we see that in Jaden Daniels? Why do we see that in Caleb Williams? These are rookies, and they look more comfortable and confident. Now, one more thing, I'm going to label the good stuff, and I'm going to hang up with you guys. The good stuff is the O line looked great. I'm sorry if anyone disagrees with me on that. I can't believe that DJ actually had a pocket. Okay. And not only did he have a pocket, but he went through his progressions, which I love. I love when DJ looks at one, looks at two, looks at three, and he makes a decision. I don't remember the last time I saw DJ do that with the O-lines we've had in the past. Uh, the D-line looked good. Burns is going to be great. I rewatched that play over and over and over again where Burns just kind of swam over to that guy, and that was supposed – it was, should have been a sack, but C.J. Stroud just got it out of there on time. Elijah Chapman, holy crap, what a diamond in the rough. And that just goes to show how our scouting department goes. And the truth is, I've already saved a seat at my local bar for the 2025 draft. So uh, that's my expectations for this season, guys. The secondary's bad. DJ's decisions are bad. I'm really hoping something turns around here. And, again, guys, you guys are great. You do great work. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's it. I'll leave you guys off the air. It's good to talk to you again. Take Thank care. you, Julian. Always Thanks, good to hear Julian. from you. Let's not start looking forward to the draft in August, please. Please. I'm begging you. <laughs> guys, don't, don't make me ban draft calls until November or December, please. I'll do it. Don't, don't make me, please. January. <laughs> yeah, hopefully February. <laughs> uh, do you have any uh, anything you want on that call or no? You're good. Uh, I mean, one thing. What do you got? The Daniel stuff. Go ahead. This is call me crazy, but uh, John, as you know, I'm a Mets fan. <laughs> yes, which has led to some dark days for me in my 31 years of life. Also a Nets fan. Yeah, but we don't have to go. That's beside the point right now. <laughs> Earlier this year, to, to start the season, Francisco Lindor, who was the Mets, is the Mets' highest paid player, supposed to be their best player. Started the season off so poorly. Was mm-hmm. hitting like 180, below 200. Just did not look good. He did last year. And he too, was didn't starting it? to get booed by Mets fans. And then there was this campaign where some Mets fans got together and was like, you know what? Instead of booing this guy who is clearly not going anywhere, why don't we try cheering him on and try to lift him out of this rut that he is in? And guess what? Since literally around that time that the Mets gave him a standing ovation in the middle of a slump, he has been the best player in the National League. Statistically, the best hitter. And it, I don't know, obviously it may not be exactly correlated. Maybe I'm a little superstitious, but I think that helped his confidence a little bit. Being like, you know what? These, even though I'm not playing well in the slightest bit right now, the fans are behind me. They know I'm here. I'm going to be here. I'm giving it my best. And guess what? He's been amazing in the last four months since. So why don't we try that with Daniel Jones going into week one? Give the guy a chance. Because like it or not, 
he's the starting quarterback for the New York Giants in the 2024 season. He's not going anywhere right now. I like your point at the end of that the most, Matt, because we could sit here and point and yell and complain. That train's out the station. He's the starting quarterback. And he is the best quarterback on the roster. He is. He's looked the we've, best in, we've seen in, in all summer. We've watched OTAs and training camp. We've seen it. He is the most talented quarterback that is currently on the roster. There's no one else coming that's taking his job right now. So just <laughs> I, I look at this debate on Twitter every day. Well, and that's your first two mistake. very ends of the spectrum with, you know, people defending him to their dying breath and then other people who are over him. And it's just like we all want the Giants to win. We want the Giants to succeed. Daniel Jones is going to be leading the offense, no matter what. Unless he gets hurt, he's the starting quarterback. So why not try to get behind him? With the pass is the past. We saw Ryan Tannehill have a breakout season, what, six years into his NFL career? I'm not saying that's going to happen. All I'm saying is root for the guy instead of looking for him to do poorly. Quite the sermon. That's pretty it's, good. We, everyone, we're all Giants fans here. I'm a Giants fan. I've said this before. I'm a diehard Giants fan since the day I was born. My family has had season tickets for 70 years. I've bled blue my whole life. I'm just as frustrated as the entire fan base. But realistically speaking, Daniel Jones is the quarterback. That's not going to change right now. So get behind him. Let's try to help him however we can. Julian was talking about how he thinks Daniel is like lacking confidence. What if the fan base actually got behind him and says, we're here to support you now? Maybe that would actually boost the guy's confidence a little bit instead of feeling like he's got a target on his back from and his honestly, own fan base. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't think a lack of confidence was an issue in that game. Like that first pass, I he dropped back so to either. throw. He threw it right to the neighbors. I mean, Don't you think he should have been a little more hesitant on that first pass instead of just throwing yeah, it I mean, out I think the fact that he... Th- Attempted to throw the ball downfield as many times as he did showed that yeah. he wasn't necessarily lacking confidence. Yeah, I, I, that's the one thing with that Julian was a great call. That's the one thing I might disagree with a little bit. I didn't see a lack of confidence out of Daniel being an issue in in this particular preseason game, but that's just me. All right, we got and, and I get it's with the Daniel stuff. It's year six. I, I don't need everyone calling in and reminding yes. us that we all yes, know. Yes, yes, but that doesn't change the fact that he's the starting quarterback for the 2024 season. We're here. Let's play. Run or Walk with Giants Legends, the Giants Foundation will host a 5K race and kids run presented by Quest on Saturday, September 7th, 9 a.m. at Life Stadium. Net proceeds benefit the Giants Foundation. All participants will receive a commemorative t-shirt after the race. There's a post-race festival with appearances by Giants Legends and a live DJ. Register now at Giants.com slash 5K. The night before that, on Friday night, September 6th, the Giants will host their Fan Fest presented by Wendy's. Met Life Stadium, doors open at 5. We celebrate 100 years of Giants football, a big ceremony honoring the top 100 Giants. Giants autographs, panel discussions by Giants legends, historic displays, photos with the Lombardi Trophy, an incredible drone and fireworks show to end the night. Get your tickets now by visiting Giants.com slash fan fest. All right, let's go to uh, Cliff in New York's been holding the longest, right, Cliff? And then we're going to get to Coach Marvin and then Len. Uh, we're going to be up against the time here, guys. So we're going to well, we're gonna go quick here, all right? We'll let um, – All right. Cliff, Coach right. Marvin, and Len, you can all call back a second time this week if you want, but I'm going to try to run through you a little bit quick here, all right? So get your Main point out, and then we're going to get to the next caller. Cliff, go ahead. All right, I'll be quick. Uh, uh, great, great work. Yes, uh, great work on the telecast. Everybody was even-handed on the telecast about everything that Daniel did. I didn't see anybody from uh, that works with the organization on, on Twitter that was anything but even-handed about Daniel. Uh, I want to I want to remind you of a huddle you did right after the draft. Was his name Risdale? Um, that that he said uh, the thing about you could not evaluate a quarterback with the way the offensive line played last year, and it's not just last year that Daniel had less than an adequate offensive line. So the grade on Daniel was incomplete. That that's what that fellow said on the huddle, um, and he also cautioned us about um, with all the excitement, which was pretty high at that time. It was right after the draft and the free agents had been signed. And, uh, and uh, he cautioned the fan base 
you know, that we still have to develop as a team. And that was what I told Dom I was calling about. I, I have been very enthusiastic all summer. I have not lost my enthusiasm. I did get tempered a bit, and it wasn't had nothing to do with Daniel. It was the way the other team looked. They just looked like they were a much more advanced team than us. And didn't they advance in the playoffs last year? Yep. Now, now this 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 year we we played Detroit. We looked a lot better against them in the preseason than we did last year. And uh, but uh, I think Houston's better than them. And uh, I think that showed throughout the game. Well, Cliff, and, remember uh, too, the, the, neither the Lions nor the Giants really played any of their starters in that first preseason game. So in terms of the game itself, I wouldn't take a whole much out of Giants Lions. I think the practices were were probably a little bit more telling. Yeah, yeah. When you said we were even-handed with them, that was a big improvement. And 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 um, uh, you know, I, I told Dom I wanted to talk about the roster as as it as it relates to the overall state of the team. Yeah, go ahead. You know, I. The, 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 well, there's another thing besides the roster, isn't there? There's, there's this mysterious thing called development of the team, and, and it doesn't happen in 10 minutes. And, and uh, they're doing that right now, and Dable's been very open about that. And it doesn't mean they're not going to be competitive and, and work their tails off. And we still have a chance to have a very good season excellent season and but uh, but it takes time and uh, that, that there are some subtleties there that i don't pretend to grasp that the pros do and and um i don't know what if you have anything to say about that but uh, i'll look forward to the next two guys because i always like hearing them thank you cliff appreciate Thanks, the call cliff. and appreciate you getting to the point very quickly all right let's go to uh, coach marvin in delaware coach what's up how are you doing john and matt always great coach what's on hey, your mind coach. today my man Pretty short of time. Um, I just wanted to comment. Uh, you know, I support the team. All these years, I've been calling, and I don't put guys down. But uh, looking at it, I mean, the, the decision making is just bad. It's when you, when you throw a pass and you, it's a bad pass. You go to a pick six, and I see you, and you got your hands on your head. You are also saying to yourself, "I just did something bonehead." And oh, those yeah. are the yeah, he did. Those are the, no argument. Yeah. He did. He owned it. But those are decisions over the over the five years. He's on the six years. That that it concerns me a lot. I mean, That's fair. you can the line. You can say there's no uh, receivers not getting open. But it's about production. It, 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 I don't care sometimes about what's in front of you or what you have. You work with what you have, and you do what you can with what you have. Don't play below that. And I just I'm starting to feel that he's playing to who he is a little bit because if you go back to that draft when they took him, the main things people were saying, oh he's good, and he's at Duke. They lost, but they didn't have any pro receivers. Well, we got pro receivers. Um, they may not be the top of the line, but they're pro receivers. So we have to play with what we have. And when I coach somebody like every year, I was getting a different quarterback, different receivers. I played with what I had. And uh, Matt was saying that people get behind you. If you're not producing, then they're not going to get behind you. I, I've been in seven championship games in my years from coaching high school and youth. And it was actually it's eight. And those years I didn't, I took some criticism from people. It's just going to happen. That's just the way it's going to be. And, and you're playing in this game and you're making the money you have. People, everybody's not going to cheer just to cheer to get your confidence. Hey, look, Coach, gotta- Coach Marvin, I totally get it. We're at the point now, Daniel's in year six. His play is going to have to earn cheers. I, I get it. That's, that, 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 that's just the way it's going to be. Absolutely. 100% agree. All right. Right. All, all I was trying to say before with that was that we're still in the preseason. Like, at least get to week one before. But, but, bef- that, but, but that does count. When I'm looking at you, I'm, I'm evaluating you in those preseason games. It's not like it don't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything as far as stats. It doesn't mean anything as far as record. But it means something to me when I'm watching you play because I'm putting you in a situation so I can understand what I see when the game starts and the lights come on. I understand what you can do for us. And if you're not doing it in the preseason, that's all I have to evaluate you on. I don't, I can't trust it in a game. So if a kid's not playing well, I got to put him in the game because his parents are good and they gave money to the school <laughs> and, and, and he didn't perform in the scrimmages. No, I'm not going to put him in the game because he didn't live up to what I my expectation. Again, I'm with you, Matt. He's wearing blue. I'm riding with him. I'm just saying, 
I'm concerned because if you have a quarterback like this and you saying this is a franchise, if he's a franchise, you're talking 15 to 20 years. Is this guy going to last 15 to 20 years with this team? Tannehill didn't. Tannehill went somewhere else. So I'll just keep it but let Lynn and um, guys, uh, I'm still with you, Matt. Um, you <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Appreciate yeah, the call. No, it's a Good fair point. point. And, and if when you want I, to call back later on in the week, you can, by the way. And when I brought up Tannehill, he, that breakout I was referring to was when he switched teams. Right. So, a little different, but... Fair enough. But look, guys, if you have concerns about those types of decisions, those type of plays, go back to the Seahawks game last year, that type of stuff, I get it. That's fine. I'm, I'm not going to say those concerns are, are, are wrong or unwarranted. Not at all. But... I just love the fact that they threw the ball down the field. It's something, and guys, the reason I guess maybe I got more excited about that than maybe people are annoyed at me for, it's like the thing we talked about all offseason and we were asking for it and it actually happened. That's why I was so excited about it because it's something that, I mean, maybe it's one of the top two topics we've talked about all spring and summer and they came out with the starters and they actually did it and, and protection was good. I know, downfield throws yeah, I know. and protection. I know. And it just, I wish... We could focus a little more on that. Yes, but we, it, we, 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 we totally get where you're coming from on those 100%. picks early because you're right. That happens in a regular season game. The game's over before it starts. For sure. And it's a loss. Luckily, this was not a regular season game. Len, you can wrap us up here. Why don't you pick your most important point, and then you can save the rest for when you call up later in the week. What do you got, pal? Yes, and I, and I will call you back, John. Yes, no problem. Um, I, I, I just want to say... Um, Matt, Matt stole my line, but he gets credit for it because he said it first. <laughs> He's the best quarterback on the team. We're going to play him. Let, let's get behind him and hope for the best with this guy. I think the emotion uh, to, to what happened um, on Saturday, uh, all this negative feeling, I think a large part of it came from, and just, just think about this, we're waiting for nine months for Daniel to get back. We're waiting all week for another game. We're waiting all morning for kickoff. And then we see those first three or four plays, and oh my God, what a downer. Not totally get it. That, that is totally fair. Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, just, just really bad. Um, Matt, your, your elders who saw the Giants in the 50s, they'll tell you they booed Connolly, they booed Tittle, they booed Tarkenton, they booed everybody, they, they, booed, they booed Phil. They booed everybody who came along after that. It seems to be a way of life in the York. And Len, you I were the remem- ringleader, weren't you? You were the ringleader leading those boos all those years, weren't you? Yes. I- <laughs> God, just no, let me, Look, let me I, give you a I remember. Len, hold on one second. I, I remember Eli getting booed his first few years. Yeah, cool. yeah I remember Eli. that. He, well, you just all of those quarterbacks, it just happened. And it's probably true around the league, too. But it does. it has happened in New York. It has happened with giant quarterbacks. But, you know, if you win the big one, everybody forgets. And, and just all they remember is the good things that happened. Matt, my, my dad, and, and John also, I remember when I'm, I'm in elementary school, right? I'm in the early 50s. And one of the things my dad always reminded me of, Matt, don't boo the quarterback. There's a lot of – he was not a coach. He was not an expert. He was just a fan like I am. But he used to tell me, don't boo the quarterback. There's a lot of stuff going on out there, and you really don't know who's at fault. Let's just get behind the team. Let's go big blue. I'll call you back later in the week, John. Len, good stuff, man. I Thanks, mean, I know you want to talk about the roster. We will get down to like the 53 and stuff like that a little bit later in the week and next week as well. And then we're going to do our over-unders next week on offense and defense. That should be fun. We'll have the final 53 next Tuesday. We have joint practices this week on Wednesday. And I should have brought those at the start of the show, but I forgot. So don't, guys, don't, don't turn off your stream yet. Um, scheduling update. So... Brian Dable has switched up the practice schedule, and it's not ideal for us. So it looks like we're going to try to go live at 3.30 the next three days, okay? Because that's after practice and after media availability. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 3.30. I'm trying to work it out with the Jets, where Detino, Casillas, and I will go live from the Jets facility after practice on Wednesday. And then uh, Friday, I'm hoping to get us back to maybe 12.30 and then carry that through, like, the rest of the year. But practice is next day start at 1.00. So I don't want to go. Except Thursday. No, I know, but I don't want to 
practice is still during that time that we usually do the show and the yeah. media at 1.30. Right. So I don't want to do three or four different times That's fair. in one week. <laughs> so we'll go 3.30 those three days and uh, then we'll figure out Friday. It'll probably be back in like that, you know, 12 30 1 o'clock area on friday and then hopefully we can set a schedule next week we don't have the practice schedule for next week either and we'll set that time and hopefully then if i can get to 12 30 next week and carry that through the rest of the regular season i will attempt to do so i just don't want to do the show before practice so then you can't really talk about what happened that day you don't have oh, media sure. it's it's it made up. And it just make, didn't make a whole lot of sense to me so that's where we are so we'll be live at 3 30 pearson will do his darnness to try to get it up in time uh before you guys are on your commute home from work so you can listen on the way home and um, that's kind of where we're at. So thanks for being with us. Quick, or, yeah, go ahead. Quick, Washington Commanders just announced Jaden Daniels starting quarterback. Not that that is much of a surprise, but we play him week two. Yes, yeah, so that is that it's is now I guess official, barring injury. So we got Donald we'll week one facing. and Daniels week two. Expected. And to Julian's point, I I did not watch any of JJ McCarthy's first game with the Vikings, so I don't know how comfortable he looked. I by the way, either. and Daniels was a bunch of just really short passes in that last game Washington played. I did watch a lot of his. And even Caleb, game, so. while he flashed, I'm pretty sure he only completed like fifty percent of his throws over the weekend. Yeah, it's not like he was blowing the doors off of anything. So. He's he's fun though. I mean, some of the throws he made were he's fun eye opening for <laughs> he's sure. He's fun. He is fun. <laughs> he is fun. Uh, for Matthew Sidetack, I'm John Truck. Thanks for joining us on Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by. Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the Giants. We'll see you tomorrow at 3.30, everybody. Until then.